Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India Namaskar students and welcome to Swayam Prabha. I am Dr. Vageshwari Deswal, a professor at Faculty of Law, University of Delhi. We are doing a course on Bharatiya Nyaya Sahita 2023, the substantive criminal law. Today is our 16th lesson of this course and today we will be discussing the topic Offences Against State and Public Tranquility. <clears throat> so students, we are dependent on the state to protect us. It is the responsibility of the state to safeguard our person, our possessions, to ensure that nobody violates our basic rights, that health care, transport facilities, all these things, they are made available to its people. But while we talk about the responsibilities of the state towards its subjects, can we ignore the responsibility that a state has towards itself? See, it is only a strong state that can safeguard the security of its people. So, anything that has the capacity of overthrowing the state or disturbing the tranquility of the state or anything which has the capacity of uh, disturbing the borders or the security of the state, now all that can be punished by the law because that would be an offence against the state. At the same time, we will also be talking about offences that disturb the peace and calm of the society or the community. See, if I have certain rights, I have rights to express myself, I have the right to do what I like doing, but at the same time, I have to be mindful and conscious of the fact that in the enjoyment of rights, I cannot do things that would amount to transgression of other person's rights. So what are those kind of offenses which have the potential of disturbing the peace, disturbing the tranquility of public? Now, we will be discussing about all that in this chapter. So, to begin with, first we will talk about offences against the state. Section 147 of the Bharatiya Nyaya Sahita talks about waging or attempting to wage war or abetting the waging of war against government of India. So, students, it is not only the actual act of waging war that is punishable under the law. Even if you attempt to wage a war, no doubt that you are unsuccessful in your attempt. That is why it is just an attempt. It has not translated into actual war. But even if you have attempted to wage a war or even if you have just abetted the waging of a war, that is an equally punishable crime under the law. See, what the section reads is, Whoever wages war against the government of India or attempts to wage war or abets the waging of such war shall be punished with death or imprisonment for life and shall also be liable to fine. So what is punishable under 147? Waging of war. Second, attempting to wage such war and third is abets the waging of such war against the government of India, against the government on which people have reposed their trust, their faith. Anybody trying to wage a war or attempting to wage a war or abetting. Now war is something like an armed insurrection. Okay. So that would be like if you are collecting weapons and arms to wage a war, even if you are abetting 
you are giving some kind of bloodthirsty uh, uh, speeches, you are writing such things, that is evoking that kind of a thing in the minds of people. So you are abetting people to wage a war against the government of India. All that would amount to a crime under this. See, illustration. A joins an insurrection against the government of India. Now A has committed the offence defined in this section. Next, coming to section 148, which talks about a conspiracy to commit offences punishable under the preceding section, that is section 147. So what does the law say? Whoever, within or without and beyond India. So you see, conspiracy could be committed within the territory of India, even outside the territory of India. But the conspiracy should be to commit any of the offences punishable by section 147. What are the offences punishable by 147? Waging war, attempting to wage war or abetting the waging of a war. So whoever enters into a conspiracy to do any of these offences and that conspiracy might be entered within India or outside India or conspires to overawe by means of criminal force or the show of criminal force. So what do you mean by the term overall? When you have created certain circumstances that the other party has been compelled to uh, relent or given. So anybody who conspires to overall by means of criminal force or the show of criminal force, the central government or any state government shall be punished with imprisonment for life or with imprisonment of either description which may extend to 10 years and shall also be liable to fine. Explanation to 148 clarifies that to constitute a conspiracy under this section, it is not necessary that any act or illegal omission shall take place in pursuance thereof. See, conspiracy is an inchoate crime. So the moment people enter into a conspiracy, the crime is committed, irrespective of the fact whether any illegal act or any illegal omission had taken place in pursuance of such a conspiracy. Now what is an illegal act? When you do something that the law forbids you from doing, that is an illegal act. What is an illegal omission? When you don't do something, when you don't perform a legal duty that the law expressly enjoins you to do. So that would amount to an illegal omission. Next is section 149. Collecting arms, etc. with intention of waging war against the government of India. So whoever collects men, arms or ammunition. See, for war, what all do you require? You need people, you need arms and ammunition. So whoever is preparing to wage war and in that course collects people, arms, tries to procure ammunition or otherwise prepare to wage war with the intention of either waging or being prepared to wage war against the government of India. So what is punishable under this section is preparing or uh, to wage a war how by the means of collecting people arms and ammunition and the intention to be either a wage of war or the intention should be to prepare to stay prepared in the event that they need to wage a war against the government of India shall be punished with imprisonment for life or imprisonment of either description for a term not exceeding 10 years then concealing with intent to facilitate design to wage war. See, whoever by any act or by illegal omission conceals the existence of a design to wage war against the government of India. How do, can you conceal? When you are aware of such a thing, when you are aware that somebody is preparing to wage a war, when you are aware that somebody is collecting large amounts of arms and ammunition for some suspicious activity, which you have some reasons to believe that maybe that is with the intention to wage a war against the government of India. So whoever, by doing any illegal act, or I mean, if you are doing something to conceal those preparations, or where somebody asks you, or where you have a duty to speak, if you don't, divulge the information that you have, 
So if you are concealing the existence of a design to wage war against the government of India, intending by such concealment to facilitate or knowing it to be likely that such concealment will facilitate the waging of such war. See, even if you did not have the intention to facilitate such a war, but you knew that if you will not speak out, then what would happen? That it will facilitate the waging of such a war. So it is not merely intention, but knowledge is also equally punishable here. And in such cases, if you had intended by such concealment to facilitate, or if you knew it to be likely that such concealment will facilitate the waging of such war, then the punishment under this uh, section is imprisonment of either description for a term which may extend to 10 years and shall also be liable to fine. Next coming to section 151, assaulting president, governor, etc with intent to compel or restrain exercise of any lawful power. See the president, the governor, they have been vested with certain special powers. So if somebody is compelling them to do something or if somebody is compelling them to not do something which they have a legal power to do. So that would amount to a punishable offence under section 151 of the Bharati Anyaya Sahita. So what does the provision say? Whoever with the intention of inducing or compelling the president of India or governor of any state to exercise or refrain from exercising in any manner any of the lawful powers of such president or governor assaults or wrongfully restraints. In the previous chapters we have discussed what amounts to assault. So where any person either assaults them or wrongfully restrains them, that is wrongfully exercises any kind of, exerts any kind of force against them or even by usage of assault, if the person is restricted from either moving in a particular direction or doing any particular action that the person wants to do or attempts wrongfully to restrain or overawes by means of criminal force or the show of criminal force or attempts so to overawe such president or governor shall be punished with imprisonment of either description for a term which may extend to seven years and shall also be liable to fine. So what is punishable here? Either you have assaulted or wrongfully restrained the president or governor from either doing something or you have compelled the person to do something or even you have if you have attempted to wrongfully restrain or by usage of criminal force or even if you have not used criminal force, you have just showed criminal force or if you have attempted so to overawe the president or governor, then that is all a punishable crime under section 151 of the BNS. Now moving on to section 152, which is a very important provision and which has been introduced in the BNS. It has replaced section 124A which was sedition and which was earlier defined under the Indian Penal Code. Now sedition was a colonial provision because that was introduced by our colonial masters to suppress their subjects in case anybody attempted to raise a voice against the colonial master. So section 124 was very draconian in its application and it was a strict liability provision in the sense that if you did any act which posed a threat to them, so irrespective of whether it was done intentionally or knowingly, irrespective of the involvement of mens rea, it was made a punishable offence. So for the longest time, our courts were grappling with the issue whether we needed to efface it from our statute books. And in 2022, in the case of Wombat Care versus Union of India, the Union of India had also directed the state to effectively take certain steps to uh, either delete this provision or enact a new provision which would not be so archaic in its application as 124A was. So finally in 2023 when we enacted the Bharatiya Nyaya Sahita, we got a new provision which is section 152 
act endangering sovereignty, unity and integrity of India. So now this is making punishable those acts which are against the interests of the country. So you see here sedition has been replaced with treason. Now it is no longer uh, Raj Drohu. Now what is punishable is Desh Drohu. So what does 152 say? Whoever, purposely or knowingly. So you see by deliberately introducing these terms purposely or knowingly, what are, have our lawmakers done? They have introduced the element of mens rea in this. So now unless and until a person has purposely, designedly, intently or with the knowledge of what the person is doing, knowing the natural and the probable consequences of his or her actions, till the time a person has not acted under this section knowingly or purposely, it is not a punishable crime under 152. So what does the law say? Whoever, purposely or knowingly by words either spoken or written. So even if you are delivering certain speeches, even if you are writing certain articles, newspaper articles, anything or by signs or by visible representation. See it is very very broad the way one can do this. It could be by signs, by gestures, visible representations or by electronic communication. Now this is again a new introduction because we have to keep pace with the changing demands of society and with the advancements in technology. So nowadays we know that every communication is happening online. So if somebody is disseminating any hatred or such uh, material via the usage of online media or through electronic telecommunications. So that is again something which needs to be covered expressly in the ambit of the law and that is why electronic communication has been deliberately introduced in this section or by use of any financial mean or otherwise. So you see by introducing this term otherwise, now what have we done? We have broadened the ambit of this provision because you never know tomorrow what else we might need to counter. See with the advent of artificial intelligence, now the society is growing at an exponential pace and so are the perils that are associated with the growth of AI. So we will need more laws to counter all those things. So that is why it has been kept open ended when we say or otherwise excites or attempts to excite succession or armed rebellion or subversive activities or encourages feeling of separatist activities or endangers sovereignty or unity and integrity of India. So here what is being threatened is the sovereignty and the integrity, the unity of the country as a whole or indulges in or commits any such act shall be punished with imprisonment for life or with imprisonment which may extend to seven years and shall also be liable to fine. Now there is an explanation appended to this section which says comments expressing disapprobation of the measures or administrative or other action of the government with a view to obtain their alteration by lawful means without exciting or attempting to excite the activities referred to in this section do not constitute an offence under this section. So you see we live in a democracy and we all have the right to dissent. So I have the freedom to express my views even if they are contrary to what the government feels. But then what I should be doing is I might express my disapproval of the measures or I might express my, uh, I'm, if I am not satisfied with what the state is doing, if I want them to improve, if I want to, them to work upon it, I have the freedom to express it. But in a lawful manner and the objective should be to get it amended. The objective no, should not be to excite hatred towards the state or encourage people to renounce or denounce the state. That should not be the objective. So anything which is done in good faith for the betterment of the country, for the betterment of the people of the country, that would be protected and that would not be prosecuted under section 152. What is being protected, what is being punishable is encouraging feeling of separatist activities, 
anything which is endangering the sovereignty, the unity and the integrity of country, no, that is what is being punished and that is something that needs to be punished. Every state has the responsibility to safeguard its people and how can that be safeguarded? By maintaining the integrity and sovereignty of its, uh, of its country. And so, now 124A sedition of the Indian Penal Code, that was an old law that has been replaced by 152. It is no longer a strict liability crime. The elements of mens rea have been expressly introduced into that. But here what is important is the implications of Section 20 of the Telecom Act 2023. Because that is one provision that permits interception of telecommunications. So there is some concern that maybe by introducing this provision and when we are talking about electronic communication also herein, there is a possibility that maybe the privacy of people can be compromised upon. Because there is a possibility that even if they don't have any material proof against a person, they might try to look for them and uh, they might try searching for such evidences, try looking for proofs and in that direction maybe your uh, privacy might be compromised because that is something which has been permitted by this provision of the Telecommunications Act. Anyway, it is too early to comment on that. We will have to wait and watch how it unfolds after once it is implemented in July. Next, coming to section 153. 153 is provision relating to waging war against government of any foreign state at peace with government of India. See, we are good neighbors and it is our responsibility to maintain good relations with our neighbors. But those neighbors who are at peace with government of India, they might be neighbors, they might be uh, not exactly bordering us, but it is our responsibility to maintain peace with them, to not start any kind of a war or unlawful activities. So towards that end, what does section 153 say? Whoever wages war, against the government of any foreign state at peace with the government of India or attempts to wage such war. See, we have to be good friends and that is why we need to protect our friendships with our friendly nations. So whoever wages war against the government of any foreign state that is at peace with the government of India or attempts to wage such war or abets the waging of such war shall be punished with imprisonment for life or with fine which may be added or with imprisonment of either description for a term which may extend to seven years to which fine may be added or merely with fine. So what is punishable under this law is waging war, attempting to wage war or even abetting the waging of such war. So attempting to wage war, abetting the waging of war or actual waging of war, whether it is done against our own country, that is also punishable under other provisions. If that is being done against a country which is at peace with us, so again that is a punishable crime. Now coming to section 154, committing depredation on territories of foreign state at peace with government of India. So whoever commits depredation or makes preparation to commit depredation on the territories of any foreign state at peace with the government of India shall be punished with imprisonment of either description for a term which may extend to seven years and shall also be liable to fine and to any for forfeiture of any property which is used or intended to be used in committing such depredation or acquired by such depredation. So, it is our responsibility to maintain peace with countries with which, with any foreign state which is at peace with us. So anybody trying to do any unlawful activities on their territory, so it is our responsibility to, to curb all that. Receiving property taken by war or depredation mentioned in sections 153 and 154. So whoever receives any property knowing the same to have been taken in the commission of any of the offences mentioned in section 153 and 154 shall be punished with imprisonment of either description for a term which may extend to seven years 
and shall also be liable to fine and to forfeiture of the property so received. So any property which has been so acquired by subversive activities by unlawful means that would all be forfeited by the state. Next is public servant voluntarily allowing prisoner of state or war to escape. See there is a difference between prisoner of state and prisoner of war. A prisoner of state is someone who has tried to in a way excite any kind of a disaffection, disloyalty or encourage people to do something wrong and that is why the person has been imprisoned by the state. And then there is a prisoner of war, so one who has been captured during war. So whoever being a public servant and having the custody of any state prisoner or prisoner of war voluntarily allows such prisoner to escape from any place in which such prisoner is confined shall be punished with imprisonment for life or imprisonment of either description for a term which may extend to 10 years and shall also be liable to fine. So what section 156 punishes is voluntarily es allowing such kind of people to escape who have been imprisoned by the state because they have done something against the state or if they were captured during war. And then under section 157 this is not uh, talking about voluntarily but when you are entrusted with the custody of such a person and if you are negligent in the performance of your duties and you negligently allow such a person to escape. Negligently means when you have failed to exercise the due degree and precaution that you were supposed to exercise when you were entrusted with such a huge responsibility and you committed negligence in performance of your duties then in such cases it is also a punishable crime. So students what is the difference between 156 and 157? While what 156 penalizes is voluntariness. You have deliberately allowed such a person to run away. You have rather facilitated the escape of such a person. So that is obviously a crime. And then at the same time, if you did not deliberately allow that person to run away, but you failed to exercise the due degree of care and precaution that you should have done, that you should have exercised. So that would be negligently allowing such a prisoner to escape punishable under 157 which says public servant negligently suffering such prisoner to escape. Whoever being a public servant and having the custody of any state prisoner or prisoner of war negligently suffers such prisoner to escape from any place of confinement in which such prisoner is confined shall be punished with simple imprisonment for a term which may extend to three years and shall also be liable to fine. In continuation uh, uh, of the earlier two provision, we have another section which is section 158 which talks about aiding, escape or rescuing or harboring such prisoner. So even if you have not voluntarily allowed such a prisoner to run away, even if it was not your negligence on account of which a prisoner of state or prisoner of war managed to escape. but you have aided the person in escaping or you have rescued that person or after that person has escaped you have given a harbor to that person okay you have shielded that person you have some sort of uh, you have done something so as to conceal his presence from the legal uh, law enforcement agencies or from other people. So if you have harbored such an offender, then what is to be done? What does the law do? The law punishes such people who do such activities. Section 158 says, whoever knowingly aids or assists any state prisoner or prisoner of war in escaping from lawful custody or rescues or attempts to rescue any such prisoner or harbors or conceals any such prisoner who has escaped from lawful custody. See students here you will must be coming across this term lawful custody time and again. So what is punishable is only the escape of such persons from the lawful custody because it is only then that the state goes after them, gets them back and punishes them. So 
whoever knowingly aids or assists any of such persons in escaping or rescues or attempts to rescue any prisoner or harbors or conceals any such prisoner who has escaped from lawful custody or offers or attempts to offer any resistance to the recapture of such prisoner. See the person has run away, you have assisted the person in running away. When the state comes after such people, you are resisting the state from recapturing such prisoner, then the punishment is very high. Punishment can be up to life imprisonment or imprisonment of either description for a term which may extend to 10 years and shall also be liable to fine. Explanation. A state prisoner or prisoner of war who is permitted to be at large on his parole within certain limits in India. See, we are very mindful of the human rights of all individuals, even if they are prisoners of state or prisoners of war. So, if there are circumstances under which such a person has been let at large, has been released on parole. So, what happens that there are certain conditions that are imposed on that person even while granting parole. So, during that time, if a person goes beyond the limits within which he is allowed to be at large, there are certain circumscribing limits within which the person is supposed to be. But if the person flees away from India, if the person crosses those limits, then it would tantamount to escaping from lawful custody. See here in such cases, he is not kept behind the bars, he is not kept at any place where he was to be meant to, uh, meant to be kept under custody. The person has been released, he has been allowed to go out on parole. There is a purpose for which he has been allowed to go out on the basis of certain uh, rights of his or because of certain obligations that he might have to perform or there might be some medical conditions or whatever the reason was that this person was let out on parole. But then again, the freedoms are not unrestricted that have been guaranteed to him. See, he is a prisoner of state. He is a prisoner of war. So, even if the state is being liberal with him, that does not mean that he will uh, just not pay any attention to the authority of the state. He has to abide by the conditions of his parole and if he goes beyond the limits of movement which he was permitted to move within during the period of parole. It could be outside India, it could be outside any other territory, whatever was limited by the state to be his area of movement during such period of parole. If he crosses that, then that is a punishable offence under section 158. Now, after offences against state, we move on to another part of the BNS which is offences affecting public tranquility and thereafter we will discuss offences against religion. So first we will deal with those offences that have the capacity of disturbing the peace of society. Article 19, Clause 1, Sub Clause C of the Indian Constitution provides the fundamental right to all citizens to form associations or unions. See we all have the liberty to gather, to congregate, but no congregation for unlawful purposes can be permitted by the law. So, Article 19, Clause 4 further lays down that nothing in subclause C of the said clause shall affect the operation of any existing law in so far as it imposes or prevents the state from making any law imposing in the interest of the sovereignty and integrity of India or public order or morality, reasonable restrictions on the exercise of the right conferred by said sub clause. So, although we have the freedom to associate, we have the freedom to gather, hold meetings, but there could be restrictions imposed on that because if anything the state feels is required to be imposed as a restriction in the interests of sovereignty, integrity of India in the interest of maintaining public order or in the interest of maintaining morality. Then in such cases, what is the state allowed to do? Impose restrictions. But then again, the term restrictions has been qualified by the term reasonable restrictions. There has to be an element of reasonability behind the restrictions also. They cannot be draconian in their, appro in their approach. Thus, Formation of assemblies is not illegal per se, but 
formation of assemblies for unlawful purposes cannot be permitted. Why cannot they be permitted? Because such unlawful assemblies could be a threat to peace and order in the society. So that is why you have the right to assemble peacefully but not with any objective to disturb the peace of the society. So now we will try and understand what amounts to an unlawful assembly. So what section 189 lays down is what constitutes an unlawful assembly? It says an assembly of five or more persons. So what is required to constitute an unlawful assembly is that there should be an assembly and the assembly should consist of minimum five people. If there are four people who have gathered together that would not amount to an unlawful assembly. In order to constitute an unlawful assembly as per the definition laid down by the law, the minimum number of persons that are required to constitute an unlawful assembly is 5. So an assembly of 5 or more persons is designated an unlawful assembly if the common object of the persons composing that assembly is. So there have to be a minimum of 5 people and those 5 people they should have a common object there should be a commonality of that object, that object should be common to all of them. And what should be the objective of that assembly in order to make it an unlawful assembly? Those all objectives have been laid down under section 189. Let us go through them. To overawe by criminal force or show of criminal force the central government or any state government or parliament or the legislature of any state or any public servant in the exercise of the lawful power of such public servant. Second, to resist the execution of any law or of any legal process. A person who is authorized by law to arrest a person upon warrant or to serve a summon upon some person and if five or more people congregate and they resist the execution of such lawful process either a summon or a warrant or any other lawful process. So that would amount to an unlawful assembly if you have that kind of an objective. To commit any mischief or criminal trespass or other offence or by means of criminal force or show of criminal force to any person to take or obtain possession of any property or to deprive any person of the enjoyment of a right of way or the use of water or other incorporeal right of which he is in possession or enjoyment or to enforce any right or supposed right. So you see what it requires is that if five or more than five people by means of criminal force what do they do? They try to obtain possession over a property, a property which is not their own or over which they don't have a right to be lawfully or when they deprive any person of the enjoyment of a right of way, there is a road which they have blocked that no, this is a private road. They, irrespective of what the law says, they have restricted a person from enjoying that road or from enjoying any kind of a river or any kind of a waterway that might be passing through that area. They have restricted people from enjoying that right and that has been done by five people acting together in the furtherance of that common objective to deprive a person of that kind of an enjoyment. So that is what would constitute an unlawful assembly or by means of criminal force or show of criminal force to compel any person to do what he is not legally bound to do or to omit to do what he is legally entitled to do. So whenever you have formulated any unlawful objective, that is when you are compelling a person to do something that, we, that the person is not legally obliged to do or when the person is legally obliged to do something, you are restraining that person from doing that thing. So that is also something which is an unlawful objective of an unlawful assembly. Explanation further clarifies that an assembly which was not unlawful when it assembled may subsequently become an unlawful assembly. See how does that happen? There is a group of people who meet. There could be minimum 5 people, more than 5 people. There could be 20, 100. There could be any number of people. Now they have met for a lawful purpose, maybe for some celebrations. 
during the course of that function or celebrations, they develop some sort of an unlawful objective. One or two persons float some unlawful ideas, the other support it and then all of them, they support that kind of an idea. So that assembly, when initially the people gathered, it was not an unlawful assembly. But the moment the objective of that assembly has become to if give effect to any of those unlawful objectives that have been given under section 189. So once the objective of the assembly was no longer those celebrations for which they had initially gathered, but now the objective has changed and now the objective is to give effect to say some unlawful activity. So now that assembly which was initially a lawful assembly has now turned into an unlawful assembly. So what makes an assembly an unlawful assembly? 5 people, 100 people, 1000 people, any number of people can meet. But the moment that group develops an unlawful objectivity, an unlawful object, what unlawful object? Any of the objects that have been laid down under section 189. The moment that assembly develops any of those unlawful objects, then what happens? The assembly transforms into an unlawful assembly. Now, whoever being aware of facts which render any assembly an unlawful assembly, intentionally joins that assembly or continues in it is said to be a member of an unlawful assembly. How do you become a member of an unlawful assembly? You went to an assembly, either you were aware of the objectives, despite knowing the unlawful objective of that, uh, uh, unlawful common object of that unlawful assembly, you intentionally went and joined that assembly. One is that. Second is, you went there, you did not know what the object of the assembly is. Now you came to know about the unlawful object. Despite coming to know about that object, you continue in that assembly. You do not disassociate yourself from that assembly. So now what happens? You have become a member of that unlawful assembly. Mere presence at that, in that assembly, despite having knowledge of the unlawful objective of that assembly, makes you a member of that unlawful assembly. And be careful that even mere membership of an unlawful assembly is a crime in itself. And that is what the law says, whoever being aware of facts which render any assembly an unlawful assembly, intentionally joins that assembly or continues in it is said to be a member of an unlawful assembly and such member shall be punished with imprisonment of either description for a term which may extend to six months or with fine or with both. Next, whoever joins or continues in an unlawful assembly knowing that such unlawful assembly has been commanded in the manner prescribed by law to disperse. See the law authorities, they come to know about the presence of an unlawful assembly. They go there, they command the unlawful assembly to disperse. Despite such orders, you don't budge. You continue to remain there. You continue to be a member of that unlawful assembly. Now, that is a punishable crime. What does the law say? I'll read it again. Whoever joins or continues in an unlawful assembly, knowing that such unlawful assembly has been commanded in the manner prescribed by law to disperse, shall be punished with imprisonment of either description for a term, which may extend to two years or with fine or with both. See, now you can see from subclause 2 and subclause 3 that one should be very mindful of the kind of company that one keeps. So even despite knowing the unlawful objective of that assembly, you don't intend to do anything which is a criminal act. But despite having the knowledge, you continue to associate with those people. You continue to be a part of that assembly. That can land you in prison for six months. And in the next clause, clause 3, what happens? If despite knowing that the assembly has been commanded to disperse, in a unity, in a show of unity with your friends or with your associates, you continue to remain there. What happens? That can land you in prison for a period of two years. So it is the best to disassociate from any kind of unlawful activities. Then, whoever being armed with any deadly weapon or with anything which used as a weapon of offense is likely to cause death is a member of an unlawful assembly. So you are a member of an unlawful assembly. How does one become a member of unlawful assembly? 
physical presence at, in that unlawful assembly plus knowledge of what that unlawful assembly is for. What is the object of that assembly that makes it an unlawful assembly? So whoever is a member of that unlawful assembly and the person is armed with a deadly weapon or any weapon that is likely to cause death is a member of unlawful assembly, then the punishment would be imprisonment up to two years or with fine. You've not used the weapon. But despite knowing the unlawful objective, you are present there armed with a deadly weapon. That in itself is sufficient to make you punishable with imprisonment for a period up to two years. Next is whoever knowingly joins or continues in any assembly of five or more persons likely to cause disturbance of the public peace after such assembly has been lawfully commanded to disperse shall be punished with imprisonment of either description for a term which may extend to six months or with fine or with both. If the assembly is an unlawful assembly within the meaning of subsection 1, the offender shall be punishable under subsection 3. Subsection 3 is when you know that the assembly has been commanded to disperse and still you are in that assembly. Punishment can range from 6 months to 2 years. Next is whoever hires or engages or employs or promotes or connives at the hiring, engagement or employment of any person to join or become a member of an unlawful assembly shall be punishable as a member of such unlawful assembly and for any offence which may be committed by any such person as a member of such unlawful assembly in pursuance of such hiring, engagement or employment in the same manner as if he had been a member of such unlawful assembly or himself had committed such offence. Then whoever harbours, receives or assembles in any house or premises in his occupation or charge or under his control, any persons knowing that such persons have been hired, engaged or employed or are about to be hired, engaged or employed to join or become members of an unlawful assembly shall be punished with imprisonment of either description for a term which may extend to six months or with fine or with both. So if you are keeping such tenants, if you are allowing that kind of people to assemble in your place, they might be your friends, you, they might be known to them, but you are aware that these people, they might engage in unlawful activities and despite that you give them a space to assemble in your premises or to stay in your premises. So that in itself would amount to a punishable crime irrespective of the fact whether you assembled there with them or not. But if you have allowed them to conduct such things on your premises, to meet, to discuss their unlawful objectives on your premises, that in itself has been, is, has been made a punishable crime. Then uh, whoever is engaged or hired or offers or attempts to be hired or engaged to do or assist in doing any of the acts specified in subsection 1 shall be punished with imprisonment of either description for a term which may extend to 6 months or with fine or with both. And whoever being so engaged or hired as referred to in subsection 8 goes armed or engages or offers to go armed with any deadly weapon or with anything which used as a weapon of offence is likely to cause death shall be punished with imprisonment of either description for a term which may extend to two years or with fine or with both. Now section 189 defines what is an unlawful assembly. It tells us that anyone who associates with that unlawful assembly, who is a member of an unlawful assembly, whether he is an armed member of that unlawful assembly. So all that has been made further punishable. Now what section 190 does is, it says that every member of unlawful assembly guilty of offence committed in prosecution of unlawful object. So for that there are two concepts that we need to understand. One would be what constitutes membership of unlawful assembly, that is something which we just discussed. What constitutes membership of unlawful assembly? If you intentionally join that assembly knowing it to be an unlawful assembly or if despite knowing 
that is despite you having the knowledge what is the object of that unlawful assembly, you do not disassociate for your, for that, from that assembly. You continue to be a part of that. So, what happens now you are a member of that unlawful assembly. So, every member of unlawful assembly guilty of offence committed in prosecution of common object. So, irrespective of the part that you played in that, even if you were just present as a member of that unlawful assembly, whatever is the crime that is committed by any other member of that unlawful assembly, you would be equally responsible and equally punishable for that crime. For any offence committed in prosecution, what is important to understand here is any offence that was committed in prosecution that is it has to be either towards the common object or anything which would any person would know, any reasonable person would know that any other crime that was likely to be committed in the prosecution of that common objective. See there is a group of 5, 6 men who set out to take a woman by force in a village. Now they know when they will do such an activity, they will be met with the resistance and there is a possibility that someone might be hurt, someone might be killed. So, whosoever is a member of that unlawful assembly would be guilty of that taking of that woman, guilty of any other crime that is committed in prosecution of that unlawful objective which could be like if somebody gets hurt, somebody gets killed, if any property is destroyed, all those crimes would also be on the heads of these people who acted in the prosecution of that unlawful objective. So, this is what is imposition of joint liability. See in criminal law ordinarily people they are to be convicted only for crimes that were committed by them. I can be punished only for things wrong things that I do. But by the introduction of the concept of joint liability, now what the law says that you are supposed not to associate with people who have wrongful intentions or wrongful objectives and if you associate with them, then you can also be held guilty for those crimes because what happens people they draw strength from numbers. Sometimes a person might himself not having be not having the guts to commit a crime, but when he feels that there are people with him, so such a person does things which he ordinarily would not have the courage to do. So that is why what the law discourages is any sort of an assembly with an unlawful objective. With a lawful objective you are free to celebrate, you are free to party, you are free to hold meetings. But with unlawful objectivity, uh, unlawful objects, with any such objects which has the capacity to disturb the calm and peace of society, now that is something which needs to be discouraged under the law. So if an offence is committed by any member of an unlawful assembly in prosecution of the common object of the assembly or such as the members of that assembly knew to be likely to be committed in prosecution of that object, every person who at the time of committing of that offence is a member of the same assembly is guilty of that offence. So you see from a language, from the language, from a bare perusal of the provisions, you make uh, you can find it uh, that the lawmakers have been very, very clear in imposition of joint liability to the extent of not only intention but also knowledge. Because what it says in prosecution of common objective or such as the members of that assembly knew to be likely. Okay. As I just gave you the example, you set out to do a crime but then you know that in doing that crime there are other crimes that can also be committed. You have to occupy possession over a land. The people who are occupying that land, they are not willing to give up possession. You go armed with weapons. So now you know that there is a possibility that somebody might be killed when you try to take that land by force. But then suppose there are seven, eight people who go there together. One or two are carrying the arms and this is not known to the other members of the assembly. Because those people who are armed with guns, they might have hidden the guns. Now you know that you want to take possession back and you are determined to take possession by usage of force. But you are carrying some small sticks or lathis with you, but not any firearm. 
but then there are two people who know that there are firearms and it is only those two who are carrying it and they have not disclosed this to the rest of the members. So the rest of the members, they cannot have the knowledge that it can lead to death of someone. They might be having the knowledge that when they are armed with sticks and dandas, it can lead to grievous hurt of some person because there is bound to be a fight. But not their liability could be to the extent of grievous hurt, not to the extent of death because the carriage of that armed weapon, it was not in their knowledge. So that is how we have to peruse the language very, very carefully. Okay. So then every person who at the time of committing of that offense is a member of same assembly is guilty of that offense because as per law, in law, they also are guilty of a crime who merely safeguard. Those who stand and wait are also equally responsible for the crime that has been committed. If you all are sharing the common objective, joint liability would be imposed on all of them. So what constitutes common object? The word object means the underlying purpose or design. Object would become common object only when it is shared by all. Thus, common object is the purpose for which the members of unlawful assembly set out or desire to achieve. Object is a mental attitude like intention and since it is entertained only in human mind, no direct evidence can be available. Thus, it has always to be gathered from the acts which a person commits and the consequent results of such acts. Common object is one that is known to all the persons who compose the assembly. The object must be common to them, that is, they must all be aware of the same and concur on it. So, students, that will be all about this lesson. See you soon with another session on Bharatiya Nyay Sahita. Have a good day. Thank you.